Hey, good afternoon. Uh, as Nikhil said, I'm Sandeep Kapoor. I'm one of the orthopedic consultants at Rodram. Uh, I uh, do foot and ankle surgery, hip and knee replacements. So my 70% of work is foot and ankle elective and trauma orthopedics. Uh, but I do hip and knee replacements, about 30% of my work. So can we have the slides, please? So I'm grateful to my colleagues, Mr. Blair and Mr. Garnetti, who very kindly prepared the presentations and I've used their slides for the presentation today. So next slide, please. So you can look at our, we have an up-to-date website now. We have all the information about what services we offer, uh, what are our results, who are our, what is the team members, how we are doing. So you can either go on Google and search the Rodram Hospital, or you can copy and paste the website. This is the, these are the uh, surgeons uh, who do the arthroplasty. I'm sure you have heard their names, but you never probably, some of you don't know them, uh, but you get letters from them and we get letters from them. So there are the six orthopedic surgeons, uh, Mr. Blair, well, what did I do? There's no point around. So Mr. Blair is the first pitcher, Mr. Garnetti, Mr. Wembridge, they are the three main uh, arthroplasty surgeons we have and they do primary arthroplasty as well as vision arthroplasty. Mr. Carmichael and myself, we do hips and knees along with foot and ankle surgery. And Mr. Rocha is the uh, associate specialist or locum consultant. So we, we provide, as you've seen on arthroplasty register and as you'll see later, we all get very good, consistent, consistently good result. And if I need a hip replacement tomorrow, I'll go to any one of them without any hesitancy. So, so I'm going to talk about the hip pain. Uh, hip pain, when it comes to you, most of time it is hip osteoarthritis. Most cases by default, especially in people above the age of 60, will be related to hip osteoarthritis. But there will be other causes of hip pain. It can't be uniformly just hip pain, doesn't mean hip arthritis. One thing you need to be careful is when person comes to you with a hip pain, you need to be very specific where the pain is coming from because very many times the hip the back pain can present as a hip pain as well especially if the person comes to you with a buttock pain you're more like always keep that back pain in mind always think whether it is the back pain coming from back to the hip joint especially if the patient has very good hip movements uh, and also be careful when patient comes to you with a very painful knee uh, and when you examine the knee, the knee looks very pain-free and very good range of movement. And always think about the hip as the cause of knee pain because the hip pain can radiate to the knee pain. Like the back pain can come to the hip, the hip pathology can, patient can present with a knee pain. So keep the neighboring joint in mind when you are looking at a hip patient with who presents with a hip pain. Uh, any patient who comes, the most of the times, they, they say the 70, there have been various studies done that in 70% of cases, if you let the patient speak for two minutes, most time in 70% of cases, you will get the diagnosis. And hip arthritis or hip pain is no different. Uh, the hip pain can be, as I said, most of time it is the groin pain. When the patient comes with groin pain, it's almost certainly hip osteoarthritis. They may came about the, com complain about the lateral hip pain, which again, can be related to hip arthritis. Sometimes they complained of buttock pain, lower back pain, or pain going down the leg. Some of them will have hip arthritis, but very likely they are going to have other uh, causes of their hip pain. Sometimes patient with hip arthritis will cause come with hip pain, but they, sometimes they come with locking or clicking sensation, especially when there is advanced arthritis, when it's a bone and bone irregularity, and they will come with these sharp snapping locking sensations. It's very common to have night, night pain, but it's not diagnostic of hip osteoarthritis. And most people will come to you complaining indirectly of hip stiffness. They'll say they are difficult, finding difficulty in dressing. They're finding difficulty in putting shoes and socks. They will start buying shoes which don't have laces. They will start using those shoe horns to put the shoes on because their hip becomes stiff and they lose that flexibility to dress up, put shoes, uh, indirectly complaining about the stiffness of the hip joint. 
that's what I was talking about, the five sources of pain, but mostly 80 to 100 percent of cases, as you say, they will complain about the lateral hip pain or a groin pain, which is very typical of osteoarthritis. So most of patients with hip osteoarthritis will have groin or lateral hip pain, uh, though a variety of areas are indicated by patients. Though everybody will complain about hip pain, you need to be careful when you, when there is, when you need to be concerned because most patients will complain about hip pain. They will be given painkillers, uh, hoping their pain will settle down. But if somebody comes with a long-standing hip pain which has suddenly deteriorated or patient is unable to weight bear, that means the arthritis which was long-standing has suddenly progressed, causing collapse of the femoral head or a fracture. And that usually leads to shortening of the limb because the hip will collapse and the patient will come and say that my hip pain has suddenly become very painful. I'm unable to weight bear. I'm feeling my leg is short. And uh, they will also describe some deformity of the leg. If somebody comes with hip pain and has a past history or whatever past it may be of any malignancy, especially breast, prostate, lung, kidney, these are the common tumors which can go to the bones. So. One of my senior colleagues used to say that five Bs, so I'll say prostate, breast, bronchus, bidney, and prostate, just to remember it. But mainly it is the uh, prostate, kidney, lungs, and breast, which usually go to the bones. If they complain of recent fall, which is not improving, always suspect a fracture rather than just think it may be a long-standing osteoarthritis. The other thing is the patients who are being treated on biphosphonates, and many patients with osteoporosis are now on biphosphonates. Whenever they are started on biphosphonates, they are warned about a risk of a stress fracture developing around the hip. So if somebody comes to you with a new onset hip pain around the thigh, and they are on biphosphonates long standing, think about a stress fracture. And if they are diagnosed in time, they can have either we stop the treatment or fix the fracture and they can we can deal with them before the bone bone breaks which it makes it slightly more complicated so a certain case of deterioration this is the patient i saw 4 years ago with a painful hip pain her bmi was 41 she was discharged with usual advice about losing weight which did not work but last week she came to my clinic with sudden worsening of pain unable to weight bear struggling to walk and she noticed that her leg has gone shorter by a couple of centimeters and you can see the difference how the femoral head has collapsed her bmi hasn't changed but her head had arthritis has progressed a loss there is some collapse of the femoral head uh, shortening of the leg uh, so it suddenly becomes an emergency and these patients we have to give priority to because they are behaving almost like hip fractures So examination, I know you, you all are very busy and you all need to uh, find your own way of doing an examination. When we start in medical school, we are taught, taught an examination of hip in 30 minutes. Then over time, we shorten it because nobody has 30 minutes to examine a patient. If, if you are old-fashioned like me, then, then you probably read this book, which, which is a Bible for orth orthopedic surgeon. So it's the orthopedic physical examination, but like most modern doctors will go to Google and look at a video of hip examination. I suggest you start with a 15 minute video, then you modify it according to your needs, shorten it to five minute examination, make sure not to miss common things. What I usually do when the patient comes to my clinic is I make them undress to the, into a gown so that I can examine to, the, to their undergarments, so I can examine and not miss anything obvious. Start with a gait examination. Most people will have a painful, antalgic, slow gait. The Trenderberg test uh, is when you ask the patient to stand on one leg, you can hold their hands, and if the hip is painful, their pelvis will dip on the other side. You measure their limb length by making them lie on the table and grossly measure their legs are equal. Then you ask them to bend their knees and see if one knee is more prominent than the other, which tell us whether the, there's shortening in tibia and femur. Then most important is checking the range of movement in the hip joint. 
Most people, you will notice that they will have good flexion because they can mimic the hip flexion from the movement at their uh, lower spine. Uh, but it's the internal and external rotation which will be very stiff in somebody who has a hip arthritis, especially internal rotation. It will be very obvious when you flex their hip rather than flexing straight, their leg will go into external rotation because most people with advanced osteoarthritis develop external rotation deformity at, external rotation deformity at the hip joint. So when to operate? This, this is a qu quality of life surgery. It's not a limb saving, it's not a life saving surgery, it's not a limb saving surgery. It depends when many people with very severe osteoarthritis will live with their pain and don't want any surgery done. They modify their life around their painful hip and live to learn with it. Many people will have very low pain threshold or a very high demand uh, lifestyle and they would like to have a hip replacement very with, even with very early osteoarthritis. So it's basically main reason for doing surgery is pain and I always tell my patient pain is something I cannot see but you tell me. When I look the x-rays do help but when patient tell me no I cannot, I've tried enough, I, I know about hip replacement, I understand that there are risks and complications, I, I want a hip replacement surgery. And when it's affecting their quality of life that is the main indication for doing a hip replacement surgery. Non-operative is the, where it's in the early parts. Most important step, even though the analgesia, physiotherapy, steroids help, but most important in our patient is the weight loss. If they lose weight, the same arthritic hip becomes less painful than in an overweight person. I know losing weight is not easy, but uh, I think that, that is the treatment which should start very early. When the patient comes to you very early with a painful hip, that's where they need to be told that they need to lose weight. Not when they come to us when there is already advanced arthritis. We tell them to lose weight. They cannot because they can hardly walk 10 yards. Uh, and they all say, I don't eat much. But it's very, very, very difficult for a person who is not able to walk to lose weight. So just start it in the first consultation. When you see an overweight patient with a very early arthritis of hip or knee or any weight-bearing joint, just encourage them to change their habit. Join some kind of activity. There is a park run in uh, two places in Rotherham. So encourage them to go and do some walk in the uh, parks or some kind of activity. So in long run, not only for the hip and knee, but even for their heart and other body. So weight loss, I always think, is the main thing which we miss. Uh, but other than that, they can have simple paracetamol, ibuprofen, stronger painkillers if somebody doesn't want surgery. Use of a walking stick, which most people don't like, but using a walking stick is much more safer than having a surgery. Steroid injections, uh, we tend to inject less hips with steroid than knees. Main reason is because injecting hip is slightly more complex than injecting knee. Hip injections are usually done in theater under x-ray guidance, whereas knee injection can be done in clinic. It can help delay the surgery. So it is useful in very elderly people with multiple comorbidities who do not want hip replacement. They can have injection to make their life comfortable. In current COVID-related uh, delays, I have received few letters from your colleagues asking patient, asking if we can do a steroid injection Patient's name are already on the waiting list, but the waiting lists are so long. Can they have a steroid injection while they are waiting for uh, hip replacement surgery? The other thing where steroid can inject is when the patient comes with the buttock pain, you see a bit of hip arthritis, bit of back pain. You are not sure whether his symptoms are coming from their hip or from their back. So you inject their hip, block their hip, and if the hip pain is significantly better, you can say that, yes, hip replacement is going to work. Uh, even though they are not going to get rid of all the uh, hip or back pain or buttock pain. When the non-operative options fail, the solution is only one. There is no half hip replacement, there is no osteotomy, there is nothing. The one solution for all symptomatic hip osteoarthritis is a total hip replacement. And total hip replacement is a very, very, very successful surgery. Uh, it's not the most successful surgery in the world. Does anybody know what is the most successful surgery we do? It's not an orthopedic surgery. No, not appendicitis. Well, maybe 
it's a very common surgery as well probably the commonest procedure cataract as yes, well done so cataract cataract gives you if the cataract surgery patient comes back to you if they don't have a 6 by 6 vision they it is considered a complication so sex cataract gives you 99.9% .9 success rate probably but hip replacement is probably the second most successful surgery the results are slightly better than knee replacement 95% of patients will come back and say thank you to you obviously it's not 100% and that's why we need to consult patient to make sure uh, not everybody gets a hip replacement even though, though they have minor symptoms and they uh, do first follow the conservative treatment before going for surgery most hip replacement if we do in people above 60 they will last a lifetime they won't need a revision if we expect the average life of 80 to 82 years uh, for men and women respectively so most people will have one rip hip replacement and will uh, live their whole life with that joint because the results have improved when it all started in 60s by Charlie they were likely to last for 20 though we still see some hip replacement done by Charlie still patients have those hips so they, they do re really do last long uh, and most people will just need one hip replacement for an arthritic hip so there are some myths which have been long standing and myths are things which are very 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 difficult to change even still most even healthcare professionals, including doctors, sometimes will say, oh, yes, a hip replacement will give you 10 years pain-free life, but what after that? Which is not true at all. We expect that we tell patient at least 15 years now, but as I say, most hip replacement will last a lifetime, about 15 to 20 years. Or later on in life, it may become a bit painful, but patient don't come back for revision. So they do not last for 10 years, they last much longer than. The next which has been a long-standing tradition that you are too young to have a hip replacement. There's nothing like that now. There's no point leaving a patient in pain during their young active years, waiting them to get 60 or 70 years old and then give them a pain-free 10 years of their life. Whatever age they are symptomatic and have arthritic hip, we will do a hip joint replacement for them. Younger the person, it may not last as long because it's like any machine. More they use it, it may become loose sooner but we do not refuse surgery if the patient is young but have a symptomatic arthritis and they need hip replacement. There are various things which they say you cannot sleep, you always have to sleep on your back, you cannot uh, do swimming, you cannot drive. All, all these are myths. These, there may be temporary restriction on patient of what they can do immediately after surgery till they are walking independently without any support but we do not stop them from doing any activity now. If the hip is stable, it is stable. If it's not unstable, sleeping on the back or keeping two pillows in between legs or not doing this or not doing that is not going to keep their hip in joint. We, uh, we do give them these booklets about hip replacement surgery, which answers the common question. I'll just uh, send them, just pass them around if somebody wants to keep a copy of this. So most people will be able to go bowling, swimming, golfing at about three months after their surgery. And we usually leave it to physiotherapists to guide them when they can drive. But again, at about six weeks, they can drive. BMI is a tricky question to answer. We used to have a, this threshold of 35, which I'm told no longer exists. But BMI is important. Heavier the patient, higher the risk of intraoperative and postoperative. And, uh, lesser the surge, the operation, the uh, hip replacement will last. As I said before, it needs to start much, much earlier than patient is ready for surgery or advice about BMI. Uh, we still see a lot of people of their BMI around 40 who have a very advanced hip arthritis. We are in two minds whether to do surgery or whether to leave them for life of in wheelchair or bed or housebound. I do not know what is the current guidance in primary care about referring patients to for weight loss surgery because at that stage they cannot lose weight by fasting or activities. I think once their BMI is 40 and they are such advanced hip arthritis, probably they just need a weight loss surgery 
before they can have a hip replacement, before they can safely have a hip replacement. We sometimes do hip replacement even though they are very, very high BMI because there is no other option but to take the chance as long as patient understands the high risks involved. What, what can you do? What happens to you when patients come to you after hip replacement? Because we, we see the patients uh, after surgery and once they are discharged, their first visit to us in clinic is either six weeks or 12 weeks after surgery. And they will come and uh, they will be seen by a practice nurse, district nurse or GP at two weeks for removal of sutures and wound uh, inspection. Erythema or redness around the wound is very, very common. That's inflammation expected from surgery and should not be alarming sign. But if patient has pain, which we do not expect two weeks down the line, and most importantly, if the wound has not completely healed and it is leaking serous fluid, hopefully not pus at two weeks time, if it is a leaking serous fluid, if the wound is red and inflamed and is not healed, that is an area of concern. It may still be harmless because most of people are on blood thinning tablets and they can have a serious discharge. But if somebody comes to a practice or to physiotherapist or to any uh, healthcare professional following surgery within six weeks with a wound which has not healed, serious discharge, that's a, that's a sign of concern. So refer that patient straight back to us. We'll be more than happy to see them. We'd rather see them then rather than later once the infection, because earlier infection can be managed much more easily by local debridement rather than a later infection when the person will need a whole revision hip replacement. So send the patient to us very quickly. Most importantly, please do not stop any, start any antibiotics because one, it may just suppress uh, infection, uh, but the infection won't be eradicated. It will keep on happening and by the time the antibiotics become effective, it will be a full-blown infection. Uh, and antibiotics can also affect the, if we do early surgery, it can affect what organisms with grow, we grow because if there have been antibiotics, it may affect the organism which we are able to get from the wound or not. So early problem is mainly wound problem. Local erythema, nothing to worry. It usually settles down. But if there is a serious discharge, non-healing wound need to be they need to come to us. The other very common thing which you will see after surgery is the painful swollen calf. Even though almost every patient goes home on some kind of thromboprophylaxis, still a large number of patients will get clots in their legs or thighs. Most of them will be asymptomatic and will not need uh, uh, any more treatment. But if somebody comes with a very painful swollen calf, uh, the DVT is the concern and again these patients should be sent back direct to emergency department for further investigation and management. So early first four to six weeks these are the main things to look for an infection or a uh, DVT or a pulmonary embolism. Some people will pre present with an acute chest pain which again could be secondary to DVT. Uh, so these are the things to look for in immediate post-op period. Later on, one, two, three, four, five, ten years down the line, patient may come back, come to you with a complaint because we do not follow hip replacement which are doing well at about one year time. Most of them are discharged now. Some do get seen at five years, the younger patients. So if they are doing good at one year, we have realized that there's no point in bringing them saying, they are saying good thing about you, you say good thing about them and then they go home. So we discharge them at one year and uh, they may come to you that I had a hip replacement seven years ago and my hip has become painful. So hip which has been pain free and becomes painful is an area of concern. It could be a low grade infection in the, it's an artificial, it's a foreign body after all, it's a source where the bugs can settle down. So there may be a low grade infection. The, the hip may become start becoming loose which can cause hip pain. There may be a stress reaction around the hip joint. So there can be multiple late causes of hip pain. They need investigation as well. I think the what investigation they can have while you see them is a one plain x-ray, which, which will tell us with anything obvious if the, there's a fracture of the, or hip is completely loose or hip is out of the joint. I don't think patient will wait to come to 
uh, as an elective for a dislocated hip. But a hip X-ray will show anything anything which is alarm, alarmingly wrong with the hip joint. And the second thing patient need to have is a simple blood test, including full blood count ESR or CRP. If they are raised, then you are worried about infection. So most hips will do fine after hip replacement. They get discharged one year. No, they won't come to you. And most people will have that hip, that hip for their lifetime. But rarely, if they come back with hip pain, think about fracture, think about infection, think about loosening, and get a simple x-ray and a simple blood test done. And if there's any concern, refer back when we'll investigate it further. Other causes which person can come with a uh, hip pain is the back pain. But mostly, as I said, they will come with long-standing history of back pain, and they will have a buttock pain going down their thigh rather than a groin pain or a lateral hip pain. They both can co coexist, and sometimes you need to find out, as I said, what is contribution from hip and back, where a local steroid injection can tell us how much benefit they are going to get by treating their hip. If local injection does not help, we send them back to you because they need to be looked at by the first by the physiotherapist or a spine surgeon for their back, uh, and they do not need any hip surgery. Sometimes osteoarthritis is usually, as I said, seen in elderly people, though we occasionally see in younger people. Uh, but uh, if a younger person comes with a hip pain, the first thing we have to think about is they could, it could be still osteoarthritis. It could be inflammatory arthritis, like a rheumatoid or an ankylosing spondylitis. But one thing you have to keep in mind is the avascular necrosis. The common history, when you ask, will be a heavy alcohol intake rarely deep sea diving or any steroid use related to rheumatoid arthritis or any other cause. Why, If they are on long-term steroid use or if they give a history of significant high amount of drinking, you need to think about avascular necrosis of the hip. The presentation will be very similar, will be a hip pain, limp, groin pain, and examination limitation of movement. But when you get an x-ray done, you will see the abnormality of the femoral head with some whitening and uh, irregularity. In later stage, you will see the complete collapse of femoral head. Again, the treatment will be in advanced stages very similar in the form of a hip joint replacement. Though if they are picked up earlier, uh, they, the hip can be salvageable. So keep that in mind. If some younger person comes with a normal looking hip x-ray, but a history of alcohol steroid use, think about AVN and early referral may save their hip. That's the x-rays which no one of us want to see. And it's not a common x-ray, but occasionally we'll see one in every three, four years in primary care. You'll say somebody comes with a hip pain. Uh, when you do an x-ray, the hip feels good on examination. The movements are quite pain-free. But the important thing is any previous history of, I'll repeat, thyroid, breast, bronchus, kidney, prostate five things if they are more likely to spread to the bone. Somebody, anybody with a previous history of treatment for any cancer comes with a hip pain, they need to have, as I said, a hip x-ray and a basic blood test. Uh, and you will see, unfortunately, some lytic areas in the proximal femur, which means that the disease has spread to the bone, causing them hip pain, though it's not a hip osteoarthritis. As I said, biphosphonate treatment is very, very common for osteoporosis. It's a known fact that they can cause a stress reaction. As you see, the increase uh, thickening of cortis and a stress reaction in the proximal femur, usually subtrochanteric region. If an elderly person who has been on biphosphonate treatment for a long time comes with a new onset, onset thigh pain rather than the groin or buttock or back pain, think about a stress reaction. Uh, it's a, Biphosphonates have been very, very useful, but there's unfortunately this side effect. Most people will be given biphosphonates and then stopped after five years to give time for bone biochemistry to become normal before they are started on again. But keep that in mind, uh, that this can be cause of hip pain rather than the simple osteoarthritis of the hip. So they usually, patient, if it is missed at this early stage, 
they will come to us at a fracture stage when the treatment is slightly more complex. So, important if it's picked, if they are picked up in early. More important, especially if they have a biphosphonate induced fracture treatment on one side, always keep that in mind when patient comes back to you. Because they, if they are on biphosphonate treatment, very likely they will develop similar stress reaction on the other side. Uh, so, keep that in mind, somebody coming to you with a thigh pain. Uh, rheumatoid people, due to multiple causes, due to inflammatory arthritis, due to steroid use, due to reduced activity, have osteoporosis and they can come without, sometimes they come with a stress fracture without any history of injury or a simple fall which they don't think much about it. So, somebody who has inflammatory arthritis or on some kind of medication which can be toxic to the bone, mainly steroids always have this low threshold for investigation because they can have stress fracture. They may not have a hip fracture, mostly they may have, I think there is a small superior pubic ramus fracture, inferior pubic ramus as well. It's very common uh, to have a stress fractures around the hip rather than hip osteoarthritis. That's the modern phenomena where we all are taking becoming more active, especially during COVID. We all, many people have become more active. Many people have had new pets. Many people have started running and we are seeing a lot more sports related injuries now. And stress fracture, though the commonest stress fracture still remains the fracture in the foot or the tibia, the hip stress fracture is rare. But a young person who has taken up new activity of running and suddenly increased their mileage, do keep that in mind that there may be a stress reaction young person coming with groin pain, do ask about any change in recent activity uh, causing a stress fracture. And have a, have a low threshold for further investigation because stress fracture may not be picked on plain x-ray. Don't dismiss it, send it for, to us for further investigation because some of them can, can be picked only on an MRI scan. There are a few other things around hip which we manage which are not osteoarthritis, especially in somebody uh, mostly around between 40 to 60 people come to us with a, either a snapping crepitus sensation around the lateral aspect of hip and lateral hip pain. It's no groin pain, hip movements are pain free, it can be trochanteric bursitis. Usually condition is related to again increased activity or some local trauma. Usually it is self-limiting, usually it settles by cutting down on activities which has brought the symptoms. Rarely patients need uh, simple non-steroidal steroidal, anti-inflammatory medication. If the condition is resistant, that is one thing which can be injected even in community by, uh, by any, any healthcare professional. Mainly it is just injecting, nobody can feel where the bursa is but is injecting with steroid and local and is setting the painful spot over lateral aspect of thigh and see if they get benefit only in resistant cases. Uh, but it does, uh, does usually settle with uh, change of activity or simple uh, non-surgical treatment. Very, very, very rarely, there are many, many procedures described, but very, very rarely surgery is done with mixed results. Sometimes people come with this burning numbness sensation of the lateral aspect of thigh, what we call myralgia parasthetica. This is due to entrapment of a nerve called lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh around anterior superior iliac spine. Uh, the symptoms are very typical of burning sensation over the lateral aspect of thigh. The hip examination is normal. Uh, again, the treatment is usually uh, weight loss, it is seen with weight gain or change of trousers. Some people gain weight and but they don't change trousers and they, they become tighter and tighter and start pressing on the nerve. So, weight loss, change of trousers, much easier, will help relieve the symptoms. Uh, inflammatory medication, anti-inflammatory medication, rarely we do the steroid, very, very rarely they need surgery. Uh, but they do not need, uh, but their hip examination is normal. An another condition in young people we see, so we have discussed most of condition which are in around 60 and older people. If a young person comes with a hip pain, 
sometimes the extra growth either on the cup side or on the head side can cause impingement and restriction of movements. So, which is called the femoral estabular impingement and the patients usually have pain at the extremes of flexion and internal rotation due to these extra bony growth causing pain. Uh, they can cause pain in young hip, their hip joint is mostly normal, the hip joint space is maintained, but there are prominent osteophytes. Usually they can be helped by either rest anti-inflammatory medication or a mostly arthroscopic surgery to excise this prominent osteophytes uh, because their joint surfaces are normal. Much younger people can have a uh, some childhood hip problem they will give, they always, they are either born with a uh, hip dysplasia or a dislocated hip as birth and they always have hip problem, their cup will never develop normally and because the femoral head is not covered properly by the estabulum, they will have a hip pain and x-ray will show that the large amount of femoral head is not covered because the cup is very, very shallow. These are the younger people if, if they are diagnosed earlier because their joint space is quite normal, they can do a femory periestabular osteotomy and turn the estabulum around to cover the hip better to stop progression of osteoarthritis and delay the osteoarthritis and the need for hip replacement. If they come later when they have already got significant arthritis, the only option may be a hip replacement surgery. More younger the person coming with hip pain, you are talking about either a slipped femoral epiphysis. You can see this side is normal where the head is sitting on top of the neck. Here the head has fallen back, the neck is pointing here and the head is fallen backwards. Usually seen in uh, adolescents near the time when their bones are about to fuse. So usually 12 to 16 age group, if a child or a teenager comes with a hip pain, Again, getting an x-ray will help us making the diagnosis or a Perthes disease which will again show the destruction but in a much, much younger age group. Some things which we do here for our hip replacement uh, patients, we, we do a twice weekly hip and knee school. It is run by the uh, charge nurse of our elective ward where all the hip and knee replacement patients will come. A physiotherapist is there and a pain team is there. All the patients whose names are on the waiting list for hip replacement, they are seen in a hip or knee school before their surgery. They are given information about hip replacement, they are given information about how to live with a hip falling hip replacement surgery, they are seen by physiotherapists, their needs are checked, what they need after hip replacement so their discharge is not delayed. And we have seen and sometimes they get to meet patients who have their hip replacement before and they learn more from the other patient than from us. Uh, so that helps in getting us better results, more satisfied patients, early discharge from the ward and overall better outcome. In our department, we have a arthroplasty MDT every Thursday morning at uh, 7.45 in the morning. When all the hip or knee replacement which are going to be done over next week or two, we all the hip and knee arthroplasty surgeons are there our theater senior staff nurses are there, our arthroplasty nurse is there. We all sit together, look at all the x-rays, straightforward x-rays as well as complex, all cases are discussed there uh, to make sure what we are doing is the best. So rather than one person making the decision, it is always better to take opinion of everybody else that what we are doing for this patient is the right treatment. We have our arthroplasty nurse uh, in our department as I say, most of patients are discharged very soon after hip replacement if they are doing very well. But they all have a number for our arthroplasty nurse where they can ring Monday to Friday working hours and can get advice. If they have any anxiety about anything, they, that's a direct telephonic line for them. Any advice about when can I drive, when can I go swimming, when can I go abroad, whatever information they need. They have a telephonic follow-up available and arthroplasty nurse also follows our patients, younger patients who need follow-up one year, five years, ten years. So she is very essential to our running of our service. Something new which has happened just before COVID and it's become more useful uh, in post-COVID era where we do not want patients to spend days in hospital. 
we have started doing by one or two surgeons in our hospital a day case hip replacement surgery. Very, very selective patients, younger people, low BMI, no comorbidities, very active but advanced osteoarthritis. When they are seen in clinic, they are referred to the nurse, mostly seen on the, uh, referred to the physiotherapist, mostly seen on the same day, made sure that they are fit enough to have a day case hip replacement surgery. And uh, now we are doing a hip replacement surgery in very selective group of patients as a day case procedure. So when I started training, the hip replacement patient will sp uh, spend <coughs> about a week in hospital. <coughs> It is down to now two or three days, but it is going in the right direction by doing a day case hip replacement surgery. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Anderson talked about hip arthroplasty register. All the joints which are done in England, there are about 80,000 hip replacements done every year, go into the onto the National Joint Registry and where all these hips are followed and if they get any complication or any problems, it gets spotted and every unit, every surgeon is somebody's keeping an eye on them to make sure they are falling within the two standard deviations of the average surgeon. And if they're an outlier, they get picked up, they, they have more training, their practice looked at so that there is uniformly, continuously improving uh, pathway in place so that the ultimate benefit goes to the patient. I'm pleased to say our Rodram dot is here, which is much, much safer place to be. So it's very reassuring for us, for you, and for our patient that we're doing well. And so this is the national average. So we were in national average two years ago, and we have improved the national average over the last two years. <clears throat> my throat is drawing, telling me that my presentation should finish now. <clears throat> Waiting time, what, what do you think is our waiting time in our hospital? Any any guess? Huh? 24 weeks? No, not that low. <laughs> well, uh, the waiting times are longer than they were pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, we were meeting that national target of 18 weeks. The waiting times have gone up. But I'm surprised when patients come to see me, uh, so I'll, I'll tell them the waiting time is longer. And when I tell them this, they feel relieved. They think, oh, we came with the idea that waiting time is going to about two to three years. So it's not that bad. I think it is all media generated and media always reports the great outliers on uh, either side because that's only make the news. Our waiting time depends on various factors, whether the patient needs inpatient surgery or outpatient surgery. Every surgeon has slightly different waiting time. If somebody gets a day case hip replacement, the waiting time will be different. So it is rough, but I checked today before this lecture, our waiting time is of different surgeon is around 40 weeks. So it helps if the patient knows when they come to us, and it also helps when the patient know that the waiting time list is not as bad as the Sun or the Daily Miller is publishing. So yes, day case surgery is much, much better than this. It is just the inpatient uh, patient waiting time is higher. But the situation is not that grim as the media makes it sometimes. So I'll conclude. So somebody comes to you with hip pain, most likely causes hip osteoarthritis, but always keep in mind whether it's coming from the back or from the knee, always keep in mind of uh, uh, other causes of hip pain, trochanteric bursitis, there are other rare causes like deep gluteal syndrome, piriform fossa syndrome, very, very rare. You probably will only see one in your lifetime and it doesn't matter whether you diagnose it or not. Uh, always keep other causes in mind, but hip osteoarthritis is usual diagnosis, especially in 60 years old. Patient will usually tell you the diagnosis when they come to you that they need a hip replacement, they have a long-standing hip pain. Uh, always get a plain x-ray, which will tell us most likely a simple hip osteoarthritis, but very, very rarely we will see occasional stress fracture or a secondary spread from a primary tumor or dysplastic hip or any other causes, but mostly an x-ray will tell us it's a hip osteoarthritis and if it is affecting quality of life, 
it most likely and the patient has tried and tested conservative treatment patient has tried to lose weight and if all that has not worked then patient needs a hip joint replacement surgery if somebody has a hip pain and the plain extra looks normal there are rare causes which a specialist will know more about it and more likely to pick up if somebody has an unexplained hip pain there may be a stress fracture which we, you cannot see on plain x-ray always refer to us for an urgent investigation and if somebody has red flags obviously it can't wait and refer to us as an urgent so i'll repeat what the urgent signs are if somebody has a long standing hip pain sudden deterioration unable to wait bear shortening of the leg previous history of cancer with a worse hip pain a recent fall patient on hip with a hip pain on biphosphonate treatment these are all cases where sooner we see the patient better it is yeah. and heavier the patient later we see better it is the other way as well okay thank you very much any questions